we have lots of folks <clears throat> coming and arriving. We have plenty of folks arriving. We have every reason to expect our uh, guest, uh, Miss Tina McSwain, any minute now, too. Um, I hope everybody took a look at the um, at the chat when you come in. I don't know, Tiffany, could you see the chat uh, window that says welcome? And it, there are some links to some cool stuff. Nope. You got to put it up. in as mm. once everybody's there because it disappears. I found that out. Ah. Okay. Well, it's irrelevant now because now you're really on the internet. And that was only like a, oh, Mickey says they can see it. Thank you. Well, I, I guess it just doesn't like me. I'm glad everybody else can. <laughs> okay, if I don't. We I was were, thinking uh, about this. I was thinking about this this afternoon. <laughs> so everybody's like, oh, yeah. You know, Christmas in July. I'm like, well, we've got Halloween in May. Right? Correct. Right. <laughs> I've been, yeah, it, it's hard to, I'm trying to square that with my seasonal awareness. I love it. Halloween is all year, you know, like I take that with me as a lesson, like uh, that, you know, like in October, you know, anything can be haunted. Like if my computer is messed up, it's Obviously because it's, it's spirit possession. So, yeah. <laughs> and it makes uh, ordinary day-to-day -day troubles and problems and pains in the butt, uh, uh, you know, fun. <laughs> okay. Uh, <clears throat> okay. Let's do stuff. Here Welcome we are. Halloween, guys. Happy Halloween, everybody. <laughs> it's all the spooks. We're, it's summertime. Um, the library is going into summer hours and... Uh, <clears throat> Tiffany and I are celebrating uh, a couple hundred, you know, a hundred and something days until Halloween. Um, welcome to History's Mysteries. We this this month we, um, after going all around the world as uh, you know as much as we can from the reference desk. Um, Tiffany and I have you know looked for. <clears throat> the learned and learned a lot and looked for the truth behind um, a lot of colorful uh, fairy tales and mysteries such as Mothman, uh, Jack the Ripper, the Donner Party, the UFOs of Shag Harbor, uh, the world of voodoo, um, ancient native folklore, um, and most recently the lost city of Atlantis. <laughs> That's great. Um, and it it makes for a really um, wonderful work day. I'm I'm constantly grateful that uh, that at any given moment, if you ask me what I was thinking about while I'm roaming the the floor of the public library, um, I'm thinking about one of those topics. Yes, always. <laughs> we are happily home for this month in the Queen City in Charlotte, and we've spent the month learning about local paranormal. Um, phenomenon we uh that can be us uh, for a library program that can be a study of neighborhoods and their histories um charlotte is replete with uh a sense of neighborhood um identification and some neighborhoods have um been lost some neighbors were displaced and the the, the city carries all of that all that history as a weight with it and um it can be something to to be celebrated but it's um it's not really even past is it because every we all still are right here in this very quickly growing and changing city um <clears throat> so the way to study paranormal uh experiences here in charlotte is to ask around and we did and we were lucky enough to be uh contacted by um our wonderful guest presenter this evening, Miss Tina McSwain. She is the founder and executive director of Charlotte Area Paranormal Society. And it's very easy to find references to Miss uh, Tina's work over the last 20 years. Um, and we hope that she will be able to tell us about it herself um, as, as soon as she joins us. And um, we're going to 
just try to spend the hour holding space for uh, <clears throat> a local luminary to share with us a lot of personal and professional experiences that I can't wait to hear about. Um, let's see. So I am recording this program um, for your housekeeping information. For your future viewing pleasure. Right. Uh, and uh, if you have a... I really like that all of these are actual streets in Charlotte. Yeah, it's Charlotte's not that big. No. <laughs> um, speaking of that, <laughs> it's nice to have a program that is entirely about places that we would all recognize if we hear about them or see them. And um, if you... If you have a story of your own, please, we I hope you'll um, unmute your, uh, your Zoom uh, and tell us all about it. I hope Ms. McSwain will shed some light on anything, but we would love to hear stories. Every yeah. single program, we Tiffany and I always say, isn't it a shame we, we are the ones that have to familiarize ourselves with this stuff because there's got to be somebody who knows uh, a lot coming into it. And in this case, we're lucky enough to have somebody like that. But um, if anybody out there has a good story to tell, I think the last thing I checked was that something between 40 and 50 of Americans believe in ghosts. But I think the number is a lot higher and it probably fluctuates depending on whether you have a, yeah. a, whether a you positive have or a, not a positive or negative experience great is all of our friends that join us that are not in the state you can come to charlotte and now you can be like oh look there's ghosts <laughs> over there and it's great <laughs> mason found some really cool stories he was telling me some on the desk it was great yeah um and then you go uptown and you realize Uptown Charlotte is uh, a, a good walking city and it's an easy city to, uh, to ask your way around. And I went uptown just to explore the other night and there were three ghost tours happening. And um, the more you look at what is written and, uh, and told about ghosts in Charlotte, the more, um, the more you realize they're all right there in front of you within uh, a block or two so with that said, I do have, I have collected uh, a good handful of <clears throat> Charlotte's uh, most well-known locations for ghosts and the histories of the buildings. And it's fascinating and it's really cool. Once in a while you find out, you realize that the place you're researching and the ghost story, you're, the haunting that you're reading about has actually been investigated by someone that you know. Um, here we are uptown uh, over top of walking Charlotte and believe, beneath this, we see, you know, underneath these, uh, these beautiful skyscrapers, we know there's Founders Hall and the Charlotte Theater, the Dunhill Hotel, the original um the the still standing main library uh discovery place <clears throat> let's see there's some very old churches hallowed and and full of stories there's uh Rira's pub that's full of stories um let's without waiting too much longer for uh miss mcswain to join us let's look at some of these uh some of these ghost stories. So again, we'll come back to Tina when she joins us. Um, Tina is the founder and executive director of CAPS. And um, among the locations that she's investigated, uh, we're going to go to a few of them. Let's travel over to the number four fire station. Fire station number four is um, one of the oldest and, and historic locations. It's on the Charlotte uh, Historic Landmarks Commission 
Um, and it's fascinating to read about the history of local fire stations in Charlotte. There's, uh, there's actually a retired UNCC professor who teaches a whole course on the stories behind them. But um, <clears throat> the original fire departments, the original volunteer firefighters in Charlotte were, um, <laughs> were uh, notorious for, you know, exhibiting some of the worst uh, qualities of um, male behavior. You know, they would frequently fight with each other instead of putting out the, the fire. Um, some of the volunteer firefighters companies, uh, some, one of them, a few of them had, they had really colorful names. Um, in, in 1865, uh, three were operating in Charlotte. Uh, there was the Hornet Steam Engine, which was a volunteer company, and uh, well, the Hornet Steam Engine and Hose Company, uh, um, and then the Independent Hook and Ladder Company. These are all volunteer <laughs> organizations. Like, so imagine your friends and neighbors um, uh, posting up to uh, to go downtown and, and fight a, a, a fire and running into the other guys. And mm -hmm. <laughs> it sounds like, you know, more of a spectacle than um, than a public service. Uh, like when the Domino's and the Pizza Hut guys like come face to face. <laughs> like. Yeah. Uh, one of the one one of the fire one of the the uh, the third that I wanted to mention, the volunteer firefighting company was actually um, recognized above the others for bravery and for service. And it was uh, Neptune's hand engine company, which uh, was an African-American um, brigade of volunteer firefighters. And uh, that's them. You can find articles about these, uh, about these um, volunteer companies. Uh, they, they, they played baseball when they weren't fighting fires. The Charlotte Observer is full of really interesting articles going way back and you can get to it at our website. Um, but uh, if you've seen fire station number four, this is it right now. And it's in the historic landmarks commission as a, uh, as a museum. And occasionally it's been, uh, option to be a restaurant, but it's a beautiful historic building and fire station number four is reputed to be haunted by a ghost who actually has a name and a history, um, the name of the ghost that haunts fire station number four is Mr. Pruitt Black. And there's a newspaper article that I'm showing you. If you can see it, um, I hope everybody can still see this because yeah, it was really fun to find this in our library's digital archives of Charlotte Observer. Um, Mr. Pruitt Black uh, and, his, um, and his firefighter colleagues were responding to a false alarm and he fell down the pole and um, <clears throat> died th shortly thereafter. Um, he's also in the Charlotte Observer previously for, um, for being a big home run hitter uh, in the firefighter uh, baseball team. Yeah. But um, in this case, you can go to Charlotte uh, Fire Station number four um, and everyone who, uh, everyone who tours and reports either seeing a figure uh, out of the corner of their eye or hearing footsteps or smelling cigar smoke. And I know it's, you know, it may be kind of um, par for the course to smell cigar smoke uh, or smoke in a fire in a fire station. Place. Yeah. But uh, it's, it's most noticeable at the, uh, on the photographs on the wall and the, the firefighter uh, societies honor all the, all the, uh, firefighters who have died in service. So, um, and this is one of the only, uniquely one of the only uh, ghosts that is predictably able to be found that has a name and a history and, uh, and a history of service. And so I, I truly love that it's, um, he's a very accessible spirit. Um, I'm sure it's probably really creepy when they're doing like the graveyard shift literally yeah. being like, okay, guys. Mm -hmm. back. Firefighter oh, station yeah. number four, station number four was also noticeable, uh, notable in recent news for um, being uh, part of the FBI scheme to, um, to catch um, former mayor Patrick Cannon <laughs> <laughs> um, in the, in a bid to turn it into a restaurant. So it was, it was a prop. It was a, um, a MacGuffin. <laughs> in the FBI plot to capture Mayor Patrick Cannon in the act. Um, <laughs> oh my gosh. 
share stories. The FBI. Um, now, here we are down the street. We're at Rira Irish Pub. And this, this pub is heavily um, uh, frequented by ghosts uh, of many shapes and sizes. It's a really, it's the second oldest building in, in downtown, in up, or uptown Charlotte. Um, and a lot of the interior dressing for this pub was brought, was brought from Ireland, including uh, <clears throat> the Victorian era bar. If anyone's been to Rira's, Arira, um, you're, you're sitting in the middle of a lot of history, uh, imported, possibly imported with all the um, relevant uh, spiritual Yeah. Um, I was about to say, asking for it at this point. Yeah. <laughs> you don't take stuff from Europe. Everything in Europe's haunted. Right? Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, it, I try to, it, we, we're lucky to live in a city that even though it's, you know, it's actually, it, it's, it's been around, it's got plenty of history. It's got accumulated history under our very feet. Remember when we talked about uh, the folklore of native North Carolinians, <clears throat> you can't walk very far without running into something that has a few generations of memory attached to it. And in this case, even more memories intentionally imported in, uh, including, let's see, the Victorian bar and the um, some of the uh, reconstructed um, uh, shrines, uh, shr shrine-like uh, decorations inside Rira Pub. But all that said, Rira, as far as being a really old building, being and being filled, being a, a, a reliquary for um, a lot of Irish heritage. <clears throat> There's plenty of ghosts that haunt Rira um, that are well documented, and you they they can tell you about them on uh, Queen City Ghost Tours. Um, just to tip off, like uh, you know, to to sound off uh, a few of them. There's people have reported seeing these are regular. If it was just a one off, it wouldn't mean anything. But these are regular uh, hauntings. There's a uh, a man in a 1920s uniform with white gloves and a pillbox cap. Um, the, the staff know to, uh, know what to expect from these, um, uh, patrons of the bar. There's an elderly man with a dog and a cane, a dog and a cane. And there's a little girl with blue eyes, curls, and a Victorian dress. Um, yeah, but, I, I could handle the rest. Not that one. Yeah. Um, that and, one. in fact, our, uh, our, our, Compadre Tina McSwain has referred frequently in what I've read to um, to girls of a certain age uh, between 10 and 12 having a lot of spiritual energy. So there are frequently mischievous spirits, um, according to people who have researched and, and done service and education and, and in this area. Um, that's a that's a fertile um, demographic for spirits, for mischievous spirits. Well, that's um, a big surprise. We've seen how <laughs> so big exhausting, exhausting 12 oh. year olds and stuff. Can be. <laughs> they just got um, too much energy. <laughs> it's, uh, it's probably the most um, exciting and, and, and alive that, you know, it's a, it's a source of vitality and that's, and, and, you know, I guess in the afterlife, that's turned to mischievousness. <laughs> um, in fact, there's uh, there's writing that appears on the wall at Rira. Uh, they won't go away. Um, that is attributed to the little girl with the with the Victorian dress, um, being persistent about uh, practicing her alphabet. On is the it wall. really the alphabet? Um, I I hope it I, is. <laughs> I think there's at least there's like the ABCs, but they're on the brick wall. If anybody's been to Rira and, and familiar with this, I would love to know more. The pictures are all very consistent, but the writing looks like it's been erased and rewritten multiple times. The most notorious, according to Queen City Ghost, the most notorious ghost at Rira, the most notorious phenomena at Rira is a pair of ghosts. 
known as that the, the staff there know as the lads. And it says it's, it's two grown uh, young men who are um, who are described by patrons as uh, having. OK, they have Irish. They have thick Irish accents um, and they're uh, one has red hair, one has black hair. Both have uh, facial hair, uh, old fashioned facial hair and um, and really strong accents. And uh, on Queen City Ghosts blog, they talk about um, a customer, a living customer sharing the bar with the two of them until he realized that they were both. Uh, they were they were fully functioning bar uh, bar flies, except that they had um, suffered grievous injuries. <laughs> so. So they spent the they spent their evening <laughs> at the bar, um, as you do, with uh, you know <laughs> spectral head wounds. Um, but that was thanks to Queen City Ghost for a really colorful explanation of uh, of Rira's most notorious haunting. Um, I'm determined to find what the writing is. That's what I'm doing right uh-huh. now. Okay, good. I'm determined. For- I need to know. And Rira, if you've been uptown recently, every, you can't miss it. It's right there on the corner um, between Founders Hall and another banking building. And um, if we go right around the corner from that, well, okay, first let's go to Queens University because I, this is Lord, yeah, Queen. This is the order of the slides, but Queens University um, is absolutely loaded to the rafters with spiritual activity. Um, it is the alphabet. <laughs> They've got a picture. There we have it. it. My gosh. We have a picture of it on this, on this website. <laughs> it's like, it looks like chalk and you've got the letter a that is really nice and neat. And then you have the letter B and then the lowercase B. Wow. It's great. It's so great. Hold on. I'm sending this to everybody in the chat because you have to appreciate how well this ghost girl writes her letters. Oh boy. Okay. Wow. Thank you, Sorry librarian. Because Queens. Wow. Queens Thank you, librarian. We just spent like the entire hour talking about Queens. Gosh. Queens University is really full of spiritual activity and it's kind of like a grab bag of phenomenon uh, phenomena um, the, um, if you remember do you guys if you're familiar with uh, FAQ City on WFAE the, our local NPR station um, Nick Delacanel went to Queens um, to find out about hauntings and the story about that's really interesting because he could testify personally to, I mean, he's, he's, uh, you know, uh, a journalist, a radio journalist who has recording equipment and, uh, when, and he, he, he speaks about, uh, the unusual, um, the unusual interference that happened that as a professional journalist, he'd never encountered before. Um, when they visited and were trying to record their story for FAQ city. So, um, uh, I, I like that in this case, the, the journalist makes it into the news as, uh, you know, subject to real paranormal phenomena. He couldn't explain it. He said it never happened. Journalist happen. is the news. Yes. And, um, and of all the places to do it, this is really great. We actually submitted, we, we put out a call to Queens University students to see if they had anything to share. And I did find some uh some uh some comments on on local paranormal blogs by queen's university students that are um that sound very um pragmatic and non-dramatic but uh you know in from the source but also describe some really strange events the queen's university uh, was started as the charlotte female institute in the 1850s and it being that it became the seminary for girls and then the Presbyterian Female College, and then in 1912, they moved to Myers Park. And through the until you know, through the from the 40s to the 80s, they became fully co-ed. That's the history in a nutshell of Queens. Right now, Queens is doing a um, doing a lot of research to understand the founders' ties to slavery. Um, 
And there's an entire set of findings that they released. You can read it on their website. There's a PDF that, that finds, um, for instance, one of the, um, the founders uh, and one of the halls was named after uh, Miss Margaret Anna Burwell, who was the wife of Reverend Robert Armistead Burwell in 1857, the first head of the Charlotte Female Institute. Uh, and they found direct ties to slavery and, 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 to, and also to specifically, you know, in detail, unsavory, uh, irresponsible and, and atrocious behavior as, a, as an owner uh, of enslaved peoples. Uh, so they they changed the name. They took down portraits. Uh, they, um, they took a deep look and a reflective look at their history and are trying to shed some sunlight on all this and uh, end up on the right side of history. And they're doing a really good job of that. But um, Miss Burwell herself um, has never really stopped haunting <laughs> um, Burwell Hall. In fact, a lot of students can claim that they um, that they have like a, a you know a fairly familiar dialogue with Miss Burwell. If you come into the into the hall um, <clears throat> past a certain point in the evening, uh, when everybody's supposed to be back in their dorms asleep, uh, lights will uh, go on and off, and footsteps and voices can be heard. And um, you would do well, like so, some of the students that I read. Um, stories for, uh, from just acknowledging that Mrs. Burwell would really like you to uh, close up behind, lock up behind yourself and go back to your dorm. Um, so there's a... Well, as any responsible adult would expect. It's like, right. you're adults now, you need to clean up after yourself. So she's she's managing. She has a, uh, you know, a, a checkered history and, and some, very, some significant stains, but she's also uh, still there. <laughs> And, you know, um, has, she can see firsthand from the uh, other side of the veil that, you know, like they got to take down the portrait. They've got to come to grips with some uh, dark chapters. Um, let's see. Also, at, um, in uh, Morrison Hall, there was a pre-World War II, there was a suicide uh, where a young lady named Clara um, uh, fell to her death and they've actually made some uh amendments to the construction so that you can't actually hang over the balcony in that spot yeah. um there's a there's a recital hall where in, in the basement i think of the recital hall though i haven't been there it's the recital hall called susan little suzanne little recital hall and you can hear the piano being practiced in the basement um these are spooky uh i bet you whoever that is, that they are an excellent piano player at this point. <laughs> you have to be. 100 years of practice. After, after about 100 years of practice, you've got to be perfect. That, okay, let's, yeah, this is a good take, actually, Tiffany. I'm going to raise my hand and say that there's a couple of behaviors that I would continue um, for the rest of my, in perpetuity, whether I'm alive or dead, I'll probably, I'll, I'll have to continue to practice my instrument. That's one of the things or being obnoxious about just rapping on things and banging on stuff rhythmically uh, for the benefit of everybody who's All sitting around with me. Rhythmically. See, that's the key. <laughs> I'm, I'm just going to end up like the little girl practicing her alphabet. I'm a painter. So I'm just going to be making. <laughs> 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 yeah. Tiffany, you just hung that painting behind the reference desk. And I know that, you know, if we ever needed a sign, even if you're just at home, you don't have to have passed away or anything. But the if the painting spins counterclockwise cool. quickly and a wind blows and lightning strikes the uh, my desktop computer, I'll know that you're displeased with whatever <laughs> with whatever decision we're making. Um, so <laughs> there's a let's see. There's the, so now many there's, hauntings there. Yeah, there's so many. I haven't even uh, gotten through these. Like. I'm halfway. Uh, the the haunting in Belk Residence Hall. This is interesting. I don't know the verity of this, but according to the student folklore, at least urban legend, student folk folklore, there was an orphanage uh, on the site of Belk Dormitory, and so you can hear at night um, sounds of children running and laughing in the sealed off attic of of Belk. 
Um, sometimes stuffed animals and family photos are found rearranged or left out as if someone was playing with them because of an orphanage uh, that used to be on the property, you know, like kind of rude messing with other people's things. So that's, yeah, yeah you're asking for trouble. I was interested, the, the was it long haul? What happened with that? Long haul? Um, there's, uh, my understanding was that there's a, um, that there was a, a hanging, maybe even a, a suicide. But the weird thing about that is that that is one of the most um, obvious, corp- almost, uh, um, overt hard difficult to ignore hauntings at queens uh i i have it on good authority from multiple articles that if you're there on campus you may actually see out of the corner of your eye and it may be so real that people have called the police (laughs) uh, to find that there's nothing there but um due diligence that's that just um, makes me think of the whole thing in what is it New Orleans? Like there's a whole thing for taxi cab drivers and stuff because they get they get got ghosts in their cars and then they drive and then they realize that it wasn't a person and then they're like wow like it, so, it's, apparently that's a thing. Wow, so it's a professional um, rule of thumb. Yep. Wow. Make sure, make sure you are not helping the corporeal challenged get to one side of the city to the other. A lot of what we're doing today, we keep on thinking because we're in, we're in children's services or Tiffany's in teen services. I'm in adult services. And that implies that there's another service department <laughs> after the adult services department. Because if you get to know your neighbors and your community well enough, then you can recognize everybody who's idiosyncrasies, whether they are, corporeal or corporeally challenged <laughs> um i i'll still be here <laughs> i'm gonna coin i want to coin that term <laughs> we came up with that well, <laughs> in some of these really interesting ones actually i think we came up with it for the queens wasn't it we were in the middle of talking about some of the queens things <laughs> yeah yeah um <laughs> services de- uh, a, a department a library department public library for the corporeally challenged is when you see books floating through and restacking, you know that um, you were, you know who did it. <laughs> you just need to leave the lights on. Maybe um, you know. Yeah. Maybe we can stay up overnight. Um, Ooh, oh gosh, I just read. Coffee. I read the next one. Oh, I know. Yeah. Oh, I read the next okay. one. It's super creepy. Yeah, um, Overcash uh, and yeah. uh, Albright Hall. I mean. I, I remember a lot of drama in my college years and, you know, um, in uh, room 303 of Hall Brown, or, or it's called Overcash Hall, room 303 <clears throat> was talked about frequently. And there's a very disturbing story about um, waking up to find a, uh, a student waking up to find uh, someone slumped over their desk with straggly red hair and you tapped him on the shoulder and it actually was the ghost because her real roommate was still sleeping in the bed. Um, and there's, uh, you know, the haunting of Albright Hall. This is Albright, um, where uh, another um, another unfortunate uh, suicide and the name of the person appears. So yeah, the, should, one, the, re- that's, the one that bothers me the most, like that one gave me chills. That one creeps me out. Yeah. Where are we going next? I don't know. Where are we going next? Um, oh, I hope, I hope we are walking right now. We're headed to the theater. We're going to Charlotte and we're going to Carolina theater. And you want to talk about, um, uh, professional, um, rules of thumb that apply, in a, from a secular profession that apply to um, paranormal, uh, statistically proven experiences, Carolina theater is really interesting. Um, and Carolina theater is another uh, location that was actually explored and uh, documented by um, 
by our Carolina, uh, Charlotte area paranormal society, Tina McSwain. Um, the Carolina theater may look something like this right now. It's uptown right across from the main library opening uh, entrance. And it's been in renovation for a long time under renovation, but it has a great history of um, a golden age of um, live shows and theater. It was opened in uh, 1927 and uh, it saw history being made on stage. Elvis Presley was there. Um, <clears throat> it saw desegregation of the theater audience, which is um, important, important um, that it was open and in, in its golden age to see that. Uh, and then in 1978, <clears throat> it uh, it closed 1978 the last film was bruce lee's uh the fist and then weird one to stop with i know right <laughs> so now it's history and then um so it's so it's historic but it's it's been continually under renovation and that means the only people that are really in there to see anything happening are construction workers so but but here's the thing about Carolina theater. It's the theaters across the country. Theaters across the country are so common to be haunted. It's so common that a theater will be haunted that <clears throat> the League of Historic American Theaters offered us. They offered a session on working with your paranormal community of theater inhabitants. And I love that. I know this is really neat. <laughs> love that so much this is a uh I, I don't understand that it's it's so many theaters and yeah some right of them do the rose thing at like one of the seats in the front and they lay the rose that was at um wow. the theater at my college did that like yeah it blows my mind theaters guys yeah i i you know theaters are a pretty charged place i guess um and they're spooky. Um, architecturally, they're really spooky. True. So yeah. the, the only thing spookier than a theater after, you know, the show is done and everybody's gone home for the night is probably like a, a, a derelict theater that uh, that has, um, you know, that looks like uh, this. I mean, the pictures of the inside of the Carolina theater are really yeah. spooky. So... Um, uh, the uh, let's see how much time do we have. Uh, so uh, the vice president of the foundation for the Carolinas, Laura Smith, uh, went to the workshop for getting to know your local paranormal theater inhabitants. Um, and then she as a result of that, as a takeaway, she invited uh, Tina McSwain from Charlotte Area Paranormal to come and do a walkthrough of the Carolina theater because workers and uh construction and people in the building report freshly replaced light bulbs going out and um uh, just in general a prevalent supernatural darkness is how it's described even you know the nooks and crannies of a well-lit building still look um uh unshakably unnaturally dark all the time but also you know a white apparition that you can see walk you can hear walking you and they attribute all of the light bulbs and all the strange sounds and the strange uh behaviors in the building to an apparition named fred who can be that's seen sometimes it's that's a name right? fred sometimes you can see fred uh standing on the balcony um staring at uh workers who are renovating but uh Tina McSwain, Charlotte Area Paranormal, and Laura Smith, <clears throat> and three other people walked the building, and they saw a different ghost in the balcony. Um, it was a lady with a voice that they could hear the lady talking about shoes. Um, and they decided her name was Clarissa. They all recorded this, and they found that um, in, the, in the distant past, but here it is in the photograph, uh, that's the... Carolina theater next door to a shoe company called Ledbetter shoes. So, um, and then, uh, then that they went all the, this party, including Charlotte area paranormal went down to the basement and, uh, they went to explore the, 
crawl space, the basement, the empty space underneath the stage of the theater. And <clears throat> it's all in an article that's that I read uh, at, at the edge of my seat. Um, the Carol, Charlotte Area Paranormal said, did you see that? And nobody was sure what she was talking about. And they repeated themselves and they all looked together and saw a floating orb under the stage. Everyone saw it. And it's in a local news article from this um, experience. They all saw a floating orb of light as it passed through the basement, under the stage, through the doorway. And then it went through one of the people. Um, uh -oh. And and Laura Smith, who is the executive vice president of Foundation for the Carolinas at the time, was the one attesting to this in the articles that I read. So, um, and I think I would panic. I love that story. Yeah, I don't know. Especially it went through somebody. Oh my I've, goodness! Wow. Yeah, the person that it went through. I don't know what I would do. I've not, I don't have any frame of reference for this. Pass out? I guess I don't know. Yeah, I, I would. I, I would. I would take yeah. Micah's, I would take your husband's way out and just zonk, just uh, <laughs> go to a happy place. Being underneath, what? yeah, I, oh I'm goodness. already anxious in theater because I'm worried I have the to go shoe on. shoe thing makes more sense now. Yeah. Yeah, it makes much more <laughs> sense because I was like, that's a weird thing to be talking about as a ghost in a balcony in a theater. Shoes. <laughs> that makes sense now. And I, personally, I think they were a little rude calling her Clarissa. That's a very yeah. stereotypical shoes girl name. <laughs> Could have picked something like Anne. <laughs> I want to know how they picked Fred. I wonder. You're on fire tonight. I don't. I really. I mean, yeah. It's one of those. Right. Yeah. Oh, and now we could ask. People will tell me. I'm going to ask the greatness that is Google. Why did they name it Fred? Why name Why Fred? I would love to know. Having a name for the ghost is really uh, my favorite part of these. If you can attribute everything to that, you can speak it into existence. As my uh, favorite old colleague used to say, "Don't you know? Don't speak it into existence. If they're going to come, let them come. But you know, if you start talking about them, they will show up." Um, this place, the bootlegger house, uh, speaks to um, a chapter in Charlotte history that is um, getting a lot of much due attention, but not as not 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 necessarily reparations. Um, the bootlegger house was a property in Little Brooklyn, which was primarily an African American successful. Uh, central charlotte neighborhood um and uh the house itself was um used to hide liquor during prohibition there's a there's a secret door where uh you where you're supposed to hide all that stuff um in the 70s brooklyn was torn down and all of its uh residents and the history of the neighborhood um displaced tarnished forever and we i have an entire history of historic charlotte neighborhoods especially brooklyn uh, which has a, a vibrant community recognizing this history and the place in charlotte that it deserves um again these people are um uh our neighbors who have a legacy and a story to tell and it's it's a community we should we should understand it embrace it and uh it's being revitalized but before that happened in the 70s when these um vibrant thriving communities were being torn down this house was moved through charlotte uh was bought and moved through charlotte um to its current um location in the fourth ward uh the owner now says there's a picture of it, of the house itself being moved, but I don't know. It's a sad moment and a sad image from a sad history. Uh, but um, again, with all that sadness comes a lot, possibly a lot of spiritual energy and the house where it is now, first of all, the house where it is now sits on top of a, um, a natural spring so there's water underground, which is which creates some strange phenomenon, like the fact that where the house is now, people, the owner records uh, wet footsteps appearing 
uh, on the stairs and on the carpet and the faucet turning on by itself. But also this bootlegger house is talked about really being one of the most haunted, most actively haunted residences in Charlotte. It's got um, it's it's got a very busy spirit that is uh, not malicious, but definitely um, uh, restless. Uh, you can have a conversation with the spirit that will result in pots being rattled or falling on the ground. Um, they had, a, for culinary purposes, they had a blowtorch that you use for doing creme brulee and stuff. And it was, it was found turned on in the pantry. Oh, that's yeah. not, that's so, not dangerous at all. So they didn't get rid of the, the culinary blowtorch. Um, <laughs> yeah. um, but also, um, let's see the, but the most, the strangest, I think part of this is uh, a chair in their living in their uh, in their dining room that was standing up crooked flo- uh, balancing on two legs and the owner of the house um, the owner of the house attests to this just being as plain as day balancing without anything uh, causing it that was visible um, and all of this together means that they have a successful cohabitation with a spirit that tries all kinds of things, locking doors that aren't supposed to lock from the direction that they are locked and so forth. See, so it's a just rude people got to right? get into places. Come on. Bootlegger house is really, uh, is busy. Not um, all then, of us can go through walls. That's just rude. Right. <laughs> I can't find why they call them Fred. I've looked all over the place. They just keep saying Fred. I think they just picked it. <laughs> why? That's going to bother me forever. There. If I just if I throughout the week figure it out, I will message all of you guys to tell you why they called him Fred. This is going to be my <laughs> mission for the rest of the week. I'm gonna find it. Here's the bootlegger house kitchen. You can sit, you can stand this in this kitchen nice and kitchen. have conversation. So this is, uh, this is the house on the corner. You, you may recognize it. Um, everybody remembers recently when uh, Latta Plantation earned um, uh, a change in ownership and messaging. Um, now it's Latta Place. <clears throat> Um, so some unfortunate language in the recent past, um, and Latta place. Now it is a historic property. Um, right now, if you're at Latta place, um, you can hear children in the attic playing with toys. There's, um, there's a giant mirror that's said to be haunted. Um, you can always hear, uh, footsteps that, uh, when you're alone in the house, um, this is a place where they do reenactments and, and so forth. So it's, it's picturesque, but it's very, uh, it's a it's, very charged place. I'm not surprised. Yeah. It's got the burden of a lot of, uh, a lot of dark history. Um, on the light side of things, the Duke mansion, uh, has just one spirit that I could find that haunts the Duke mansion. Um, Wait, it's this... I think I found it. Mm. They did just make it up. It's rude. <laughs> so rude. Random name. Friend so Duke. The article, I'm going to put the article in there. The article says preservationists have been working for some time to rehabilitate the formerly grand theater. And it can be imagined that the restoration will raise spirits, both literally and figuratively. One theater technician <laughs> called the theater a little tea party with all sorts of guests. Just amazing way to describe that. He says he encountered one guest who he dubbed Fred in and around the booth at the top of the house. He believes the spirit to be a former technician. Other more shadowy forms have been spotted flitting throughout the ruined house while photographers have captured anomalies. They just, just right. picked Fred. Okay. Uh- I don't you know, know that bothers me so much, but it does. Thanks for finding that. You know, maybe as a takeaway for this program, we can all agree. I remember as a kid reading a book about ghosts that what you're supposed to do when you encounter a ghost is you're supposed to say, um, in the name of the uh, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, uh, who are you and why are you here? 
and they're supposed to answer you if they if you talk to them that way. Um, that doesn't go over so well with just like uh, customers coming to the library or you know meeting people on the street. Who are you and what are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> or if you're in checkout, if you're in the checkout at a grocery store, you don't need to do that. <laughs> but for um, for a spirit. The penalty for that is that you will forever be called Fred, which is not your name. You just randomly pick names like Clarissa and Fred for you. You have to answer or else you're going to get a real dumb name. I don't know why that bothers me so much, but it does. <laughs> Where were yeah, we? Well, we have lots of follow-up. Um, the Duke Mansion, if you've been to the Duke Mansion, now it's owned by a nonprofit and you can do... Uh, I think it's a bed and breakfast, but as well, it holds events, but um, there's one spirit. It's called Heavily Haunted, but there's only one story I found about um, an owner named John Avery in the, uh, in maybe between the 1930s and the 1960s. It was owned by a man named Avery, and uh, he met and fell in love with a journalist who visited, and uh <clears throat> because it couldn't, it was an affair that couldn't last. They agreed that they would meet a year later in the gardens. And he said, dead or alive, that was his closer. They would meet there. And you're just uh, cursing. You're just cursing yourself with that. You know. Yeah, Don't those were pretty heavy handed. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, and that, that actually took place, but he was on the, um, on the down end of that bargain. So she did arrive uh, a year later. She brought a friend and she met John Avery dressed. He was dressed all in black and he walked straight through them <clears throat> saying the words dead or alive to. Uh, hey, two ghosts about that? on this list. I'm not, I can't, I can't with, we've got two. <laughs> that, nope. Every time I tell a story that's, you know, in questionable taste this way, we're getting closer and closer to Halloween, but um, there's, we have a long way to go. <laughs> mm. um, there's the garden of the Duke mansion. Um, the Dunhill hotel is another haunt with a name. Um, the Dunhill hotel. If you've been uptown, you can see this beautiful, uh, front and uh, the Asbury's restaurant is next to it. It's there on the corner. It has a very imposing classy look to it. Now. I like this photograph a lot. Um, the Dunhill uh, was opened in uh, 1929 as Mayfield Manor um, by architect uh, or designed by architect Lewis Asbury, who the restaurant downstairs is named for now. Mm -hmm. Um yeah, and the Dunhill is haunted by a ghost named Dusty. The Dunhill is also reputed to be haunted by any number of businessmen who um, uh, decided to take the uh, to to um, to uh, throw themselves off the roof during the Depression. Mm, so yeah, you can spend a night. So you can spend the night on the um, in the in nine oh six in room nine oh six and. Um, and some people have reported that they couldn't get a good night of sleep in that room because the frequent sound of uh, <clears throat> ghostly uh, businessmen falling past the window. Oh, that's the worst. That's oh. a real. On the fun side of things, though, uh, Dusty is the ghost with the name at the Dunhill. His I, name is I Dusty. I was about to say, is there a reason for this name? So in the 80s, they found a skeleton, definitely a skull, definitely most of a skeleton in the basement of the Dunhill near the elevator shaft. And <clears throat> it was only identified as someone who may have had a limp, um, uh, uh, never really identified by name the remains, but... Um, Dusty uh, knocks on doors, closes blinds, and moves objects. He opens elevator doors. <clears throat> Dusty has a lot of personality and seems to be just fair, just a playful character. Uh, but all the staff of the hotel know. Some of them refuse to work in 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 the in that room. I think it's nine oh six. Past that, a certain point in the evening, um, 
but you know it is you know if you're if you're a ghost hunter you know exactly where to go and what to look for um at the dunhill and you might enjoy a pleasant night's sleep or you might enjoy like a really exciting uh adventurous experience the dunhill I is beautiful i don't want the adventure <laughs> no and let's see so, so about the names <laughs> really really so, dusty where did they find this where did they find it was it in a closet because if it was in a broom closet i'm gonna be mad <laughs> <laughs> so there's lots more you can see and do in charlotte uh if you're on um the hunt for paranormal i i promise you if you go uptown and walk at any point in the evening on a beautiful night like this um you'll see at least a couple ghost tours and somebody who makes their career in service educating uh and ameliorating these paranormal problems can tell you a lot of stories that um that we don't have but they're stories about your own neighbors charlotte neighbors alive and dead in the queen city tiffany what are we doing next month oh my gosh next month um okay we're doing kidnapped by fairies and it's not what you think because all of these stories like as most people know you've got the story and then you've got all the subtext so we're going to talk about all of the subtext that you don't think of when you're like oh fairy tales okay kidnapped oh. For abducted reason. by fairies abducted by them oh i found out where they found dusty it was sad he was at the bottom of an elevator shaft <laughs> like, yeah it's so sad yeah yeah and they talk about uh when you're staying there as a guest you might feel a tingling at the base of your neck um and it's dusty admiring your cranium <laughs> so next month we get to talk about the other veil uh, the uh, parting of the other veil between this world and the fairy world. Yes. And um, we'll have, I think for that, we should have some kind of a bestiary where we talk about how to know and identify all these creatures and, and how to stay away from them. <laughs> right. Yes. Oh my gosh. Like, okay. Both of these are right up my alley with the Halloween thing. Cause no, if you don't know me, Halloween is my jam. That is where I culminate all of my excitement into the year. And it's hilarious because I hate scary stories and scary movies. So <laughs> doing this one was really funny. And some of my reactions was, was because like, it's like, Mason, I've got to learn about this with the audience. I can't, I can't be sleeping with this just yet. <laughs> So I've been I've been doing the opposite with him being like, oh, my gosh. So there's a story where the people got kidnapped and this is what that meant. And they didn't really get kidnapped. It was really this. I've got I'm like the guy with like all of the, the strings and stuff in the background, like telling people this. So, yeah, yeah. I'm so excited about next month, y'all. Like, like I said, me too. Like I said, at the beginning of the program, I love uh, that this defines my month working at the library if you see me here if you see tiffany or me here and you ask what we're thinking about chances are we're thinking about this month we'll be thinking about uh the fairies <laughs> we'll be thinking about uh the spirit world <laughs> it's the so most we've had a question about how to sign up for the next one and i'm gonna put a link in the chat once i find it if That's I a great idea. Correctly, because <laughs> you know history, histories is not spelled with an L. <laughs> <laughs> a uh, common mistake. It's a very common. Mistake. Yes, please. All right, guys, that should take you to abducted by fairies, and like I can't tell you how pumped I am for this. Right. Like this I, one I was so sad. And the next one is also sad in a different way. I didn't see it coming. 
I can't wait. So let's uh, let's pinky swear that we'll all meet back here at the same time uh, next month. I'm not going to say dead or alive. Just stay no. safe. No, stay safe until then. <laughs> Yes. Stay Thank safe. You. Have a great time. We love having all of you guys being weird Thank with you. us. It's a great time. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thanks Matt. for coming. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Hello. Oh, but they make business, they make money in the cities with those ghost tour. I think I have another ah. one. Yeah, I didn't realize there were so many ghost tours. Oh uh, like I was, like, I knew of one, and then it's just like they're everywhere. Okay, <laughs> all right. In all, in all the cities, when well, I see, uh, they do in Chicago also, but even in Canada, it's uh, in the summer you can do ghost tour. And... That's so I it's think amazing. That's funny. I read something online that said that um, Americans and Europeans are both scared of the other countries for different reasons americans <laughs> are scared of the Euro european countries because it's old and everything's haunted the european uh -huh. is scared of america because it's ginormous and haunted <laughs> i was like i i definitely feel that after reading some of this stuff i'm like wow okay yep yeah <laughs> yep <laughs> We have our own stories to tell at the branch anyway. Like I've come in. The flower and, pot knocking over is the one that gets me. Yeah, it was on, it was on camera. Cam the, the pot threw itself across the room and everybody was watching me. I walked by in the morning to get the computers all set up and I made a note of it. And then I went away to get a sweep uh, to sweep it up. Um, and they were like, you, you, they watched the camera and they're like, you didn't clean up the mess. And I'm like, go back and go back further and watch the mess cause itself, like watch the pot throw itself across the room. So everybody was, <clears throat> everybody was talking about that, but they all named it too. They knew that uh, it was a former colleague. Which is terrible to think about. But <laughs> you know, so, some people, they, when they buy a, a house, they, they bring some people to clean it or stuff like that, because well, I know that, uh, you don't know what could have happened in the house. And oh, yes. Some, we all, I, I know that in France, okay. I believe yeah. in that, that some house maybe are not good for you to live because maybe something bad like incest or I don't know, someone was killed. Or, yeah. yeah. I'm telling you, Sage, you go in, if you're staying in a place for an extended period of time, you need either sage or salt. Something. Uh, salt? Okay, sage, I think I listen about that. But, uh, Yep, salt is a kind of all-purpose thing. I know that uh, here at this library branch, we're under Tiffany's protection because she did that, like her, you know, <laughs> I did as part of her orientation. Building. Um, Don't tell people that, but I did. I went in when nobody was there and I saged the building. <laughs> I didn't say anything. I said we're under your protection, but yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah, I know. So and, I, and we maybe we that's why it. we, we haven't seen the ghost. <clears throat> Yeah, maybe it's been plenty of messes to clean up, but we know who to blame for all of it. <laughs> Me. All right. We but should a ghost with, okay. a ghost with uh, some hair. For me, a ghost is wet, you know? <laughs> <laughs> Just know it by the name. It's not Fred. <clears throat> not or Mason. whatever the other one name was, Clar Clarissa. All right. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. All right. <laughs> Okay. Thank, okay. You. okay. Thank you. See you. Next month. Bye. Hey, it's great to see you. Yeah, I can't wait to see you next month. Yes, Thanks. I will register two spots <laughs> left. So I have to register now. Bye. <laughs> Bye. Hi, mom. <laughs> I'm gonna pause I can't on find the unmute button. <laughs> I didn't talk very much for this one because I didn't read the stories because I really did want to actually find out with everybody else. Well, I think y'all did good. Mason did good. We was going to try to send you. We was going to try to send you that. that